I'd like to call this uh, Powhatan County School Board meeting of June 22nd, 2021 to order. Uh, Mrs. Hockaday, please let the minutes reflect that all board members are here except for the uh, exception of Mrs. Smith who is uh, running late and will be here shortly. And the superintendent, Dr. Jones, is also here. So if we could go ahead then and uh, approve the uh, draft agenda, unless anyone has some changes that they'd like to make. So moved. Sorry. All right, we have a motion and a second to accept the draft agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion passes for zero. All right, we will move on to closed session. Uh, Mr. Walters, I believe it's your turn. Could you read for us the, um, uh, oh, excuse me, before we do, I forgot. Um, we are on a time constraint because of our joint meeting uh, with the Board of Supervisors at 6.30 this evening. So we'll need to adjourn our meeting at 6.10 so that we may pick up, walk to our cars, drive safely over to the village building, find a parking spot, walk to the building, and set up for the joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors to begin at 6.30 this evening. So, uh, da -da 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 -da. Mr. Walters, if you would please convene us to closed session. Madam Chair, I recommend and make a motion to enter into closed session pursuant to code 2.23711A1 to discuss the employment, resignation, and leave of specific employees pursuant to code 2.23711A2 and A4 to discuss the expulsion and school placement of specific students and pursuant to codes 22.1-60 and 22.1-60.1 to discuss the evaluation and contract of the division superintendent. Codes 2.2-3711A1, A2, A4, 22.1-60, and 22.1-60.1, and to consult with legal counsel and briefings by staff members pertaining to actual or probable litigation. Codes 2.2-3711A1, A2, A4, and A7. And that's a recommendation in the form of a motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. All right, motion passes for zero. Uh, we are now in closed session, and we should be back uh, about 5.30. Thank you.
Hi. So, Mrs. Smith, so we um, came out of closed session, and Mr. Walters has read the um, reconvening to open session, and we have all, we just voted. I said yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we will move on to uh, number three, the consent agenda. Uh, the superintendent's addendum to the contract. Uh, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the addendum to the superintendent's contract. All right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right. Well, I would like to say that I am opposing the addendum to the contract because I do not agree with having an automatic salary increase in the superintendent's contract. Anyone else that needs to say anything? Madam Chair. Mrs. Smith. Um, I'm going to agree with you on that. And um, I as well think that um, that should not just be automatic. Are you finished? I'm done. Yes, thank sorry. You. All right, anyone else? Madam Chair, I, I will Mr. say. Mr. Cole? Uh, thank you. Uh, if we wanted to make a change to that contract, there was something that should have been discussed earlier. It's kind of late in the ball game to be discussing this at this point. I understand the concern about that and that, that clause in the contract. It has been in Irby Superintendent's contract since I've been a member of this board with no objection from any board members. So the objections have come late, but we're at a point right now where we need to take action. Um, and, you know, so I just make that comment so people, so the public knows. All right, you finished? All right, thank you, Mr. Cole. I'm Anyone finished. else? All right, hearing no one, we'll do a roll call vote. Those in favor of approving the superintendent's addendum to the contract say aye. Aye. No, Mr. Cole, I'm aye. sorry, wait, excuse me. Those opposed say no. All right, Mr. Cole. Aye. Mrs. Smith? No. Mrs. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Walters? Aye. Mrs. Email? No. All right, the motion passes three to two. All right. Next on our agenda list is the uh, open board discussion on the 2020-2021 fiscal year end budget amendments. All right, Dr. Jones, did you have an explanation for us? I do, Madam Chair. Um, each year at the end of the fiscal year, we um, approve uh, proposed year end amendments to the FY2021 budget categories as presented. Those categories are attached. Um, and we do this so that we are able to balance out based on our spending um, to um, have an approved uh, budget and are asking for approval of the amended FY21 budget as presented. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Do we have discussion from any board members? So if I understand correctly, Dr. Jones, we don't need to take any action tonight? We, um, we do need to approve this item. The um, board is um, required to approve the pro proposed year and amendments to the budget categories. Okay, so then uh, we will need to, someone will need to make a motion then. I make a motion to approve the fiscal year and budget amendments. I'll, I'll second the motion, but I, I do have a comment before we vote. All right. So we have a motion and a second to approve the fiscal year and budget amendments. And now we will open up for discussion. Mr. Cole. Yes, ma'am. I, I, 
once again, this is an, this is an information that folks need to know that the, the budget amendments are due in large part to the CARES Act funding or the related CARES Act funding that we, the additional funds that we received uh, and some, some additional money that came through food service. So it's, you know, so basically then we're accounted, we're accounting for additional revenues that we did not, did not know about when we first, when we approved this budget a long time ago. And we're accounting for a, a profit in the food services area that we did not anticipate either. So um, there's no additional county funds that were expended in this budget. Uh, basically, it's, it's basically just adjusting their budget to reflect the, re the receipt of those dollars from the federal government and, and in, well, the, the, the food service surplus, which once again came as a result of federal government funding because we were able to do additional things with food service that we had not done before. Madam Chair. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Uh, Dr. Jones, if he could answer, uh, um, speak to the school grant fund. Since have we, is this something that has been, that's set up or just becomes a fund as monies from the federal government come to the system and we don't spend them within the fiscal year but past the dates? And I guess my biggest question is, is this money that the uh, Board of Supervisors can tap into, or is this hands off as far as they're concerned? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let Mr. Johns handle the okay. mechanics of that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Be glad to. Um, the uh, county has had a grant fund for years, and then their uh, policies, what's unspent in those grant funds automatically rolls forward at year end. Uh, the county has set up a school grants fund very similar to what they have because some of these uh, federal revenues for uh, uh, CARES, ESRA, and CRF are to be spent over multiple years. And so whatever we do not spend uh, this year will automatically roll forward. And no, ma'am, those are not available for the county to tap into. They will stay with the school's uh, account. And the guidelines for using that money stay the same, or do they yeah, change? they stay the same. If we have more than one year to spend it, we still have those guidelines and structure that we have to follow. And we have to report that back to the federal government um, at the end of the grant and, sh and show documentation that it was spent on those items. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, we have a motion and a second to approve the amendments to the fiscal year end amendment. One or two? Just one. Amendment. Yep. All right, amendment to the fiscal year end budget. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion passes 5 0. All right, next we have a discussion of town halls. We uh, have received uh, emails as well as comments during our public comment period requesting us to, to hold town hall meetings, uh, to have back and forth dialogue between parents and constituents and us, the school board. And so we are going to, that's why it is on the agenda to discuss this evening. So I will open it up for discussion. Madam Chair. Mrs. Ayers. Um, because of our current meeting format, where only two of us can meet with the public at a time, I would recommend contacting our school board attorney and asking if indeed we can all sit at a town hall meeting and participate, or if that would go against our policies. And if we can, what does the agenda have to look like or need to look like? I'm, I'm not okay. sure. Anyone else? My, my understanding of the town hall is, 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 is follows what you say, Ms. Ayers, and, and that we can't all be present at the same town hall. We would have to be limited to two people or one person 
you know, so there could only be one or two of us at a town hall. We'd all have to, you know, we'd have to schedule those independently or in coordination with each other. Um, well, so I was going to ask the attorney if we could call it a meeting and have that format is what my question is. I mean, it would definitely be a meeting if we're all together, but I want to ask the attorney if we can have a town hall format in our, at our meeting. So that we could have the back and forth dialogue right. during the meeting. Correct. So it's a meeting slash town hall. So you want to know this information from our school board attorney. Correct. If we okay. can. I, I would suggest do. before we do contact the attorney and spend the money that we contact VSBA and ask them that question. If there's anybody else in the state of Virginia that does anything like a town hall, you know, they would know. And, uh, I tried to contact Elizabeth Ewing but her email kept coming back to me, so I don't know what I was doing wrong, but I did try to contact Elizabeth Ewing at VSBA to ask the question. Well, All right, Mr. Cole, did you wanna try contacting um, sure, VSBA? Sure, I'll, I'll call Gina okay. Patterson and, and, and ask her. Okay, and then you would let, let me know? Sure, so I'll then, do that, um, no problem. If we don't get an answer, then uh, are we in agreement that I will contact our school board attorney to discuss this issue? Yes, I, I think Smith. so, yes. But um, is this a meeting that uh, Dr. Jones will need to be in attendance? Well, I think it, that's all up to us what we want to decide okay. after. I think right now we have to find out what we legally and legally cannot do okay. to hold, hold these meetings, these town halls slash meetings. Oh, great. So then I think we would get, we would decide together at the, um, the next meeting or a meeting to decide what format and who we wanted to include. And uh, quite frankly, if it's gonna be a regular meeting, we usually have the superintendent at our meeting and I would think that we would want to, but I don't wanna, you know, tell the other board members what they, you know, they may have other opinions. Madam Chair. Mr. Just, Walters. Just a question or a comment, I guess. I mean, there is nothing that prohibits an individual board member from hosting or attending a town hall in their respective district or frankly anywhere within the county, I suppose, and mm -hmm. at the invitation of a group. Um, certainly we are all elected in districts. Mm -hmm. um, I represent the citizens of District 4. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if a town hall is scheduled in, in Ms. Smith's district, for example, in District 2 and she's invited, I think that's completely up to her whether she attends as their elected school board member. I think the, the complication happens if the expectation is that all five of us come at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, think it's very, I think it's a much simpler proposition if one or two members attend a meeting if, if there's an invitation extended in that fashion. I mean, that, that gets us away from the issue about it being a formal meeting. And I guess that's a comment as much as it's a question. Okay. All right, well, um, Madam for, Chair. Okay, what, Mrs. Just Smith's a comment. comment, and then yes. we're gonna have to wrap okay. it up because Sorry. we've got another meeting. Go ahead. The, uh, the point of the town hall, though, is for the citizens to gather information or answers to the questions that they have. If they're asking questions that we may or may not be able to answer, we would need the superintendent's input to answer those questions. I wouldn't feel comfortable in trying to answer every question a parent might would ask me about what went on into the, what's going on in the schools. Just a thought. Madam Chair. Dr. Jones. It's typical when town halls are held, as Mr. Walters has said, that there'd be one or two members present for the complications of meeting laws um, and that staff would be there to assist the board members mm -hmm. in answering questions and providing information. We're happy to do that. So not necessarily you, Dr. Jones, but necessarily, or would you want to be to do this? Oh, no, staff? I would want to be there. I okay. may just, there may be other staff that would come to assist. Okay. Yeah. All right. And there's no law to prevent more than one staff member to come? No, ma'am. So are we, Mr. Cole is still asking the question to VSBA, mm -hmm. and then he's gonna let me know, and then am I still contacting the school board attorney to um, discuss the issue, if all of us are there? 
I would like to know the answer because yeah. I think that the people are asking for how our board collectively feels mm -hmm. about, I'm not sure they want individuals because an individual has no power, the board has power. So I think that the community is wanting our board collectively to know our feelings about some issues. Ma okay, Madam Chair, so I, I'm not suggesting we not do that, Madam Chair. I'm just okay. saying there's another alternative as well. Sure. So I, oh, I was sure. just saying that there's, okay. there's two, two paths here. Okay. So that, okay. that's all I was suggesting. All right. Thank you, Dan, Mr. Walters. All right. So then that's what I'll do. I will um, wait to hear from Mr. Cole about the VSBA contact, and then I will um, contact our school board attorney to discuss. All right, and then we will move forward. We do need to stop now um, and uh, move on to public comment um, very quickly. Oops. In accordance with school board policies BD, DH, and KD, any resident of Powhatan County may address the board during public comment. At this time, citizens are invited to address the board. When it is your turn to speak, please come to the podium and wait to be recognized by the chair. Each individual will have three minutes and delegations will have five minutes to provide their comments. Please respect this time limitation so others may address the board. A maximum of 30 minutes will be designated for public comment this evening. Please address your comments to the board as a whole, not individual board members, the audience or staff, and please begin by stating your name. The board requests that all speakers maintain an environment that promotes listening and respect. The board will not respond or address issues raised by speakers during the course of public comment, and speakers are reminded that the board chair is authorized to stop or remove any speaker who uses vulgar, disruptive, or threatening language. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated. All speakers should sign up for public comment, providing their name and address before approaching the podium to speak. If speakers have handouts or information for the board, please give these to the school board clerk before approaching the podium. All right, the public comment period is now open. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Megan Ellis. I have been a teacher for a decade now. I have taught in inner city school at a gifted center, and for the past six years, I've been at Powhatan County. Despite the differences in schools, one thing remains the same. The needs of our students are unique and ever evolving. For those who know me as an educator, you know that I am passionate for my students' education and their individual well being. For those who don't know me, I can assure you that I will never stop advocating for every single student to have the best chance that they can in a successful life. With that being said, I've spent the last month reading and listening to opinions and quote unquote facts about what I am teaching in my classroom. And I would like to set the story straight and explain what really happens in our classroom. I say ours because I'm an inclusion teacher and I co-teach with a special education teacher. The first 10 minutes are critical to our day. And while it looks chaotic, we are observing and assessing our students. Is my sweet girl in the corner eating breakfast? I know she gets herself ready and on the bus alone each day. Has my boy coming down the hall had a good night's sleep? He told me that his parents arguing has been worrying him and keeping him up. Do my, did my student who just walked in get a chance to shower this morning because she told me her hot water heater has broken and they can't afford to fix it until the end of the month? Why does this other student look like he's about to cry? What happened on the bus? And for the next six hours, these children are with us together as a unit. It's our job as their teachers to make sure that they are all in a place mentally and physically where they feel free to learn. And while these are hypothetical examples and each should be addressed on an individual basis, this is where social and emotional learning comes in. Once the morning chaos has settled down, it's time for our meetup. This is a time where we come together as a group. Some days we discuss a quote, read a book, play a game, share something we're excited about, or maybe even something we're worried about, like when the tornadoes hit Powhatan a few years ago. While our meetups are typically at a specif specified time, they really happen organically throughout our day. The social and emotional skills that we help foster create our safe, respectful, responsible, and kind classroom environment. In our classroom, each student is welcome. Every student has a voice that matters, and all students are valued. 
We celebrate each other. We encourage each other. We stand up for each other. We respect each other. And we are kind to each other. I hope our conversations lead our students to find their voice and confidence to use for good. I hope they learn to see the beauty in their world and how much they have to offer it. This is social and emotional learning. The VDOE website has a simple graphic that explains the five components of social and emotional learning. And for the interest of time, I will not read them, but encourage everyone to review it. What part of social and emotional components do we not want and value in our classroom? I hope that we can all agree that we want a safe place for our students to grow, take chances, make mistakes, feel loved, and supported by their peers, teachers, and school personnel. Thank you, Mrs. Ellis. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Allison Yandel. I live at 1880 Hope Meadow Way. Members of the board, I am a 14-year county resident, a second grade teacher at Pocahontas, and mother of two children in the school system. I've been teacher of the year at the school level, reading teacher of the year regionally, and most recently, I achieved national board certification, an honor held by just under 3% of teachers nationwide. I earned these credentials through passionate teaching and reflective practice. I did not come to the following conclusions lightly. When the Sanford Harmony curriculum for teaching SEL first came under scrutiny, my initial and most jarring reaction was that of confusion. Reflecting on my past 17 years as a teacher, character education has always incorporated, or I'm sorry, whew, has always been incorporated within the curriculum. Previously, I've collaborated with my teammates, guidance counselors, and um, have done my own research into planning for lessons related to what is now known as the Castle Five, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. My lessons were often driven by the happenings within my classroom. This could be as simple as teaching students to be engaged listeners in a conversation. It could also address more serious issues, such as how to handle themselves when a fellow student repeatedly antagonizes others. Before I was introduced to Sanford Harmony, I held daily morning meetings. We would gather, sing, and have guided conversations. I often included picture books to inspire conversation. Our new curriculum follows a similar, for similar format, calling these gatherings meetups rather than morning meetings. While I do often make these meetups my own, Sanford Harmony simply provides resources to supplement what we are already doing. Never, at any point, have I come across a lesson that teaches critical race theory. My current understanding of CRT is that it's both polarizing and political, neither of which are characteristics of education related to social and emotional well-being. Do I believe in teaching our students love, kindness, and empathy? Absolutely. Do I want them to comfortably and openly rejoice in their uniqueness? Without a doubt. All students deserve to be seen, heard, and celebrated. I wholeheartedly believe that Dr. Jones and his outstanding leadership team share similar ideologies and have no political agenda. Equity, diversity, inclusion are not dirty words, and extremist groups treating them as such need to stop. As a fierce advocate for children and literacy, I also implore you to stop the banning of books. While not every book is fitting for a whole group SEL lesson, our students must have access to widely celebrated age-appropriate books. I will leave you with a quote from Rudine Sims Bishop. Books are sometimes windows offering views of the world that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors, and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as a, as a part of a larger human experience. Reading then becomes a means of self-affirmation, and readers often seek their mirrors in books. Please, for all of our precious children in the community, keep the doors and windows open. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Yandel. Anyone else wishing to speak to the board, please come forward. Seeing no more movement, I will close the public comment period. 608, the meeting's adjourned.